We're live again. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Great, thank you. Happy to be here this morning. I'm happy to have you. Uh, Matt is a founder and CEO of Block Native. Uh, so Matt is going to talk about Mempool One on One, which ties nicely with our presentations that we had earlier from from Flashbots and uh, StakeDAO. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, uh, Matt. The stage is yours. Lovely. Thank you. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Cutler. Uh, I'm founder and CEO of Block Native, and we're specialists in uh, mempools in public blockchain networks, in particular uh, Ethereum and other uh, major L1s. Um, we really focus on making uh, mempool data easy to work with, programmable, as composable as every other aspect of the ecosystem. And we've been doing this now for the better part of three years. And, and when we started, um, mempool data was perceived as somewhat esoteric and uh, Gosh, there's not much interesting there. And, and certainly over the course of the past 12 months and, and even in the past few months, it's really come to the fore as quite cent central to a settlement on public blockchain networks. Um, and as other speakers have already shared and, and we'll talk about today, um, uh, it matters to basically all participants in the ecosystem. If you're a builder, if you're a trader, if you're a user, if you're a uh, infrastructure provider, um, you have to deal with mempool and mempool data. And today what I'm here to talk about is basically mempool 101 to provide a foundational understanding of how public mempools work and, and how they impact the experience of transactions at all levels of the stack. We'll go about an hour today, give or take. If there's questions out there, I'll be happy to take them. Um, I'll even show some some live mempool data as well uh, that if we have time, um, it makes it really come alive and makes it easier to work with. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Um, I have a presentation here that I'll be running through. And there we go. Um, and uh, you can see here, we have this notion of what you don't know can hurt you. Um, and so I'll just bash through this. Uh, we're going to talk through how transactions really represent complexity, get into mempool 101, talk a little bit about the meme pool. I can't tell you how many times people confuse these two terms. Um, we like to do memes on the mempool. Um, this whole theme, which of course has now been fairly well established as a mempool as a dark forest and the benefits of mastering the mempool. Um, one of the pieces that we talk a lot with our uh, our customers and, and prospects about is how uh, transactions themselves are sort of shockingly complex. But in the traditional fiat world, we sort of take them for granted. And so it turns out that regardless of where transactions happen, whether they're on public blockchain networks or elsewhere, there's intrinsic complexity uh, involved with them. But we're generally, and in the fiat world, insulated from that complexity. So uh, we're very familiar with the aspect of using a credit card and putting it into a machine. And I always ask people, you know, have you really thought about what happens when you swipe a credit card and, and what happens while you're waiting for it to clear? And in variable, variable people say, no, you know, I haven't really thought about it much. So it's actually pretty surprising that these are all of the uh, entities. There's, I think, six different commercial entities that are involved in every single swipe of every single credit card. And, and the, the logistics here and the orchestration here is quite sophisticated. And the credit card processors, Visa in this case, um, basically manages all of that complexity on behalf of the participants. So the risks inherent in these transactions are mitigated by a centralized actor in Visa. Um, by the way, that's not just for credit card transactions. Stock transactions have very similar uh, complexities. So imagine you're using your phone to, to buy or sell some Amazon shares. Um, these are all of the entities that are involved in settling an equities trade here in the United States. Um, this is actually from a, uh, uh, a regulatory filing. Sort of all of the messaging and back and forth that needs to be settled, needs to, to be worked through in order to uh, finalize and settle an equities trade. And the, the central party here is called the DTCC, and they process an incredible volume of value every single year uh, through these networks. Now, here we are, of course, we're here at Zero X Hack to talk about Ethereum. And so again, we have this fairly simple, straightforward interface. This is obviously Uniswap. And you know what's going on behind the scenes? There is just as much, if not more, complexity and risk associated with transactions in public blockchain networks. Um, but of course, it's quite different. 
Um, first off, because of the nature of uh, decentralized networks, there is no one party in the middle. And so this, by the way, is a snapshot of the Ethereum network. It was from uh, a few months ago. Uh, basically, at the moment of the snapshot, there were uh, almost 9,000 unique nodes in the uh, public Ethereum network. And all of them together receive transactions and orchestrate to uh, confirm transactions. And there's incredible um, nuance to this process and surprising degrees of inconsistency that can emerge across this network, particularly under periods like we've recently seen of significant network congestion. Now, the transactions are complicated. It doesn't matter if you're doing a credit card transaction or stock transaction or a public blockchain transaction. But the big difference and the reason why the mempool matters is, of course, there's no centralized entity in public blockchain networks to insulate the participants from these intrinsic risks. So these risks, therefore, accrue directly to the participants. And it turns out that they're pretty nasty, that there's a lot of issues and challenges that can emerge, as you have already heard from other speakers, and as we'll discover today, for any participant who's in these, um, who's playing, you know, in, in, these, in these networks. And so fundamentally, we think that it's really important that these uh, the data that's inherent in in-flight transactions be exposed to all participants equally. Um, and we'll talk a bit about this, but some of the fundamental asymmetries that exist with mempool and mempool data and how that creates inequities in participation in the system that basically creates haves and haves nots. You have different parties who play with different rules and that basically have different terms of settlement as a result. And we think this is fundamentally uh, problematic for any public blockchain network, but Ethereum in particular. So getting into it, what is the mempool? By the way, it's often called the transaction pool. Uh, there actually is some interesting debate. It's always been a, a matter uh, between different blockchains where not only do different blockchains call this area different things, but actually different node implementations. So you might hear transaction queue, you might hear transaction pool, you might hear mempool. We generally find mempool is the, the, the common term of art that most of the category use. And it's the shared staging area in front of a blockchain that enables transaction ordering, transaction fee prioritization, and general block construction. It's it's the place where candidate transactions go in order to be considered for inclusion on chain. Um, and, and it turns out because this is the pre-consensus layer, which we'll talk about, uh, the rules of the road are entirely different in this world. And in fact, the rules themselves can, can start to change depending on general network conditions. So uh, one of the things that public blockchain networks like to represent is that they're these very consistent environments with very equal access that are very predictable. And it turns out the mempool is kind of none of those things. Um, so another way that we like to frame it, if that you know on-chain data and blockchains represent immutable truth, once transactions get confirmed and on-chain and a certain number of blocks have gone, gone by, you can't change them. So you can look back with perfect record at, at what the truth was. Uh, the mempool contains all possible future truths. The only way to go on chain is to appear in a mempool, whether that be a public or private mempool. And if you can understand this mempool data at a census level across the entire network, you can actually, not sort of, but actually see the future. And so we think this is super powerful. And by the way, this is fueling tremendous growth of our business. And why, by the way, it's not optional. If you're building in this ecosystem, if you're trading in this ecosystem, if you're just a user of this ecosystem, you cannot ignore mempool data. Or in, in ignoring mempool data, you basically uh, um, suffer significant consequences in terms of transaction predictability and in terms of uh, final settlement. So this whole notion of by mastering the mempool, you can actually see the future. In the case of Ethereum, it's up to 13 and a half seconds into the future, sometimes more. Other blockchains, you have different timing factors here. But at the end of the day, wherever you have consensus, you're going to need a layer where you have pre-consensus because if you don't have a pre-consensus layer, then anyone can write anything to the chain. And then why do you have a blockchain in the first place? You have to be able to validate the transactions. So this is not optional. And this is something that uh, impacts everybody. And this is why we do what we do at Block Native to make this data easy to work with. So getting into mempool 101, as, as I mentioned, it's the pre-consensus layer. So what does that mean, right? That, that it's the thing that happens before the network can begin to establish uh, what it's going to accept on its network, which means 
every transaction protocol dex that builder trader user deals with the mempool and and the pre consensus layer determines the fees you pay which these days gas fees have been all over the place uh, on ethereum and so the the reality of gas fees are a function purely of what's going on in the mempool um, it affects transaction ordering where you've heard from many other players in the ecosystem who are now beginning to get much more precise and provide much more uh, visibility and control into the nature of transaction ordering and how transaction ordering can impact transaction settlement, the timing, how long it takes, uh, the slippage associated with any uh, transactions that you're doing. You uh, insert a transaction expecting certain terms of settlement, and then between the time that you do it and the time that it actually settles out, there's slippage. And, and it should be, you, one would think that slippage could be positive or negative, but in practice, it's always negative. You as a trader, you as a user, always seem to pay the consequence of, of slippage. You never benefit from positive slippage. And of course, there's reasons why. It has to do with transaction ordering and some of the automated systems operating operating in this space. And then finally, just the general terms of settlement. So when one is conducting transaction, having some sense, having some clarity, having predictability on fees, uh, uh, fees, timing, and slit settlement in particular, turns out to be really critical for determining profitability, determining if this is a good action or a bad action. And, and the idea that we all enter into these transactions with a real lack of clarity on what these need to be and what's going to happen and probabilistic outcomes. And sometimes it works in our favor and sometimes it doesn't. We think is, is a fundamental issue for any public blockchain network and basically providing clarity and order here is a giant benefit to all participants in the ecosystem. So in other words, of course, the mempool matters. However, uh, it doesn't really work like the way that most things in public blockchain networks work. The mempool is fundamentally opaque. Um, and it's, opa it's opaque because there's no truth. Because it's pre-consensus, things can change, right? Um, it's mutable. There's no truth. There's no such thing as a mempool. It's easy to talk about as the mempool or, or one mempool. But it turns out that every node in the network has its own unique instance of the mempool. Um, the nodes of the network communicate with each other over the gossip protocol. And during periods of low network congestion, there can be general consistencies that node A, node B, node C might contain very similar sets of transactions within just a couple of percentage points. But under periods of, of high traffic and congestion, like we have witnessed recently, um, you wind up getting significant lumpiness in the mempool fabric. So depending on what aspect of the mempool you're looking at, which nodes you have access to, you may see wildly different uh, uh, sets of transactions than one sees in other parts of the network. And if you're trying to basically understand what's going on across the entire network so that you can uh, price your transactions appropriately so that you can respond to things going on, during these periods of congestion, it can be, in, in fact, exceptionally difficult to have a uh, visibility into what's going on across the board. Um, Mempool, uh, sorry, public blockchain systems are, are discrete. They move forward with every block. So in the case of Ethereum, it's every you know, 13 and a half seconds on average. But the mempool is not subject to that at all. You can have transactions appear in real time from all over the world. And so it's a sub-second real-time streaming environment with transactions constantly uh, uh, coming in and coming out and being replaced. And so as a data volume and data um, uh, latency environment, it's a very different environment. Um, everything in this world is mutable. You can change it because there's no consensus yet. So you can overwrite transactions in the mempool. Um, it's probabilistic. So there's no deterministic behavior of here's what exactly is going to happen. All you have is based on the current contents of the mempool, based on the specific transaction, here is a probability of settlement and settlement terms of the given transaction at a given time. But of course, there's actors who can then change those probabilities, who can, who can see what's happening and take action in response and change those probabilities. So everything is in flight and everything is moving in this area. And then finally, the data itself in the mempool is incredibly sparse because it's sub-second in real time, because all the nodes in the network need to participate, there's very little um, sort of uh, fat in the system. So the mempool data itself is just the minimum amount of fields to, to make it work with everything else being sort of up to the user to expand. So if you're just dealing with raw mempool data, there's a bunch of work you have to do just to enrich, to make sense of it and make it usable. Um, 
Uh, and then finally, as I've sort of alluded to, it's not this sort of benign environment where, hey, people put transactions in and things happen. It's inhabited by uh, uh, predators, by automated systems who, who use this reality to their benefit in order to profit uh, from the actions and the MEV of the network. And so, you know, if you show up in this, in this area expecting it to be a relatively uh, gentle place, you will oftentimes be surprised at just how um, aggressive activity can be in the mempool. So whenever you're committing transactions or submitting transactions to the mempool, you're not alone, right? There are others who are monitoring, many others who are monitoring, who are looking to see how they can modify uh, what they're doing in order to profit uh, off of off of you. So um, because it's mutable and because it's programmable, so hey, anyone on the network with sufficient technical expertise and sufficient access can inspect the mempool in real time and then basically uh, make it programmable so they can create ad, uh, automated systems that react to it. They can create, an, or they do create an adversarial environment where bots are there looking out to uh, take advantage of any opportunity to make a profit regardless of, of the impact of that. Um, this is what's known as the dark forest. This is a term which was coined by uh, this sort of seminal blog post, Ethereum is a dark forest by Dan Robertson and Georgios Constantinopoulos from the Paradigm team. And this kicked off the whole meme about, hey, really understanding the nature and sophistication of the predators lurking in the mempool and uh, their capabilities being quite sophisticated. And so um, there are now a bunch of techniques and a bunch of tools to either catalyze and capture that value or to protect that value. And we think this is very healthy for the ecosystem. First, that these techniques be understood and be um, discussed in the public. And second, that builders are now developing uh, solutions to uh, make this less opaque and more transparent. Now, we at Block Native believe fundamentally that mempool data is difficult to capture and difficult to work with. And therefore, we provide platforms that make it uh, not just easy to access and work with, but actually extend it in ways to level the playing field. So you as a builder, you as a trader, you as a user have access to the same tools and techniques that some of these apex predators do so that you can uh, build with this data effectively and, and understand what's going on and have visibility into it. So our whole point is to make the mempool, uh, transform it from this sort of uh, scary, unusual, um, uncertain area to something which is understandable, transparent, accessible, normalized, programmable, composable, just buildable. So here we are at Zero Hack. You may be thinking about um, what you're looking to build as part of all of this. And we very much encourage you to uh, consider and incorporate mempool data into whatever you're building. And of course, we're providing tools to make that very easy to do and work with. Um, now, just sort of in retrospect, to sort of meme it out a little bit, and we'll go into this. Uh, Traditional transactions, whether they be uh, credit card transactions or whether they be stock transactions, are, are sort of very mature, very well orchestrated, um, very routinized. And it's kind of like this classic you know, waltz where everybody's dressed a certain way. It's all very elegant and all very um, wrote not very much variability because m many of the risks, risks have been removed from the system. Um, we like to think about uh, public blockchain networks as sort of fun. They're like a flash mob. We're all going to get together. It's going to be decentralized. We're all going to meet at a certain point. We're going to do something together. It's going to feel really fun and spontaneous, right? But it turns out that because of the profitability that's associated with the adversarial actions that are possible in the mempool, that it's, it's not like this at all. It's not this fun, happy, collaborative uh, uh, environment. It's much more like a mosh pit where you have a bunch of actors who are colliding with each other, often violently. And, and while there is certain sort of norms or, or, or ways of acting in the mosh pit, um, there's also sort of every man for himself, uh, every person for themselves. And so we like to say, if you expect a mosh pit, or expect a flash mob, but wind up in a mosh pit, you're going to have a bad time, right? That that you're going to get hurt. You expect to show up with your cute outfit and and you do your little dance, and what you wind up with is a is a bloody nose potentially. Um, that's problematic. 
And, and this is true of public blockchain networks. If you expect consistent or predictable transaction behavior, you're going to have a bad time. And that's why we do what we do. And that's why we're here to share today. So getting into the mempool as a dark forest, um, this comes from this science fiction book um, uh, by Chi and Lu. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, it's part of the three body problem uh, uh, trilogy, but it, it supposes that, hey, look, the network is full, or sorry, the universe is full of life, but um, nobody knows every uh, other's intentions or their capabilities. So the only safe thing to do is be quiet because as soon as you announce your presence and reach out, there are uh, uh, actors out there who may view you as a threat, who may have superior capabilities and may decide to attack aggressively, right? And so uh, this is true of the mempool as well, that uh, going through uh, quietly and silently and not announcing one's intentions can often be uh, important and profitable. So again, we have that, that core piece called Ethereum is a dark forest. There's been a whole series of posts that have come on top of that, staring into the monster's eye by Alex Manuskin, um, uh, how to munch on pickles from a whale dinner. Um, we wrote a piece uh, now uh, approaching a year ago um, describing the events of what was known as Black Thursday uh, and, and describing real evidence of systematic and, and system uh, sort of across the board manipulation of the mempool on Black Thursday. Um, that post is available and it's a relatively comprehensive post that uh, begins to explore some of the edge effects and edge conditions of um, very intentional activity by things like Hammerbots, the results of mempool compression and how basically various actors in the ecosystem can and adversely impact the ability of others to get transactions on chain if people aren't familiar with what's going on. Um, there have been a series of posts recently about how to escape or circumvent the dark forest. There's a bunch of building going on here, which we of course are participating with collaboratively as well. Um, at the end of the day, all of this goes to show that all transactions incur, uh, incur real transaction risk. And um, the mempool basically is the source of that inherent transaction risk in public blockchain networks. So now let's shift gears into mastering the mempool. Um, and, and the basic idea here is there's a sequence of capabilities that we can work through to basically build up um, your, your competency here. So what I wanna do today is sort of show some examples of, of techniques you can use today to um, basically become more sophisticated as you go forward. So first off, we're gonna start with something very simple, which is hot wallet monitoring. Um, I recommend this to everyone and anyone I've ever shown this to basically immediately starts doing this. So you can be aware of transactions, both incoming and outgoing to your uh, hot wallet so that you can be you can monitor your own activity and you can know when others might be um, airdropping you something or might be sending you something. Um, then we're gonna look at smart contract transactions streaming. So how you can use the same techniques, not just to look at a wallet, but to look at a smart contract address and stream transactions associated with them. Um, we're then going to talk about how you can get into gas estimation via block prediction as opposed to time prediction and why that's so important. And then we're going to wrap up with a relatively sophisticated capability that, that's called transaction simulation, where you can look inside pending internal transactions and expand them against the current block state to understand not just um, what sort of traditional or, or external transactions are going to do, but, but look inside the entire set of transactions that are pending so that you can understand likely uh, outcomes of those and act on that. So with that, um, we're going to first talk about hot wallet monitoring. So uh, what we're going to do is basically uh, set up a mempool data feed to detect inbound or outbound activity to your hot wallet. Um, and, and so the whole idea here is uh, transactions on public blockchain networks, particularly during periods of congestion, can be very anxiety inducing. And by uh, adding visibility to the process, we can significantly reduce transaction anxiety. Now, um, this is also important because it provides sort of basic understanding and visibility into how mempool monitoring actually works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a different tab, and I'm going to be flipping back and forth a little bit here. Um, I'm going to share my mempool explorer chrome tab um, and so uh, what we have here is this is a tool that block native provides uh 
Block Native Mempool Explorer. You can get to it from our homepage or explorer.blocknative.com. And critically, this is uh, publicly available and, and free to get started with. So if this is something you want to do, uh, please go to explorer.blocknative.com and, 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 start, and, and start working. Now, uh, I have here in this Chrome tab um, my MetaMask, which I'm not sure you're going to be able to see, but I'm on the Rinkeby testnet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy uh, my address to the uh, to my hot wallet, and this is my personal wallet address. Um, I'm going to create a subscription, and what I can do here is rename this, and I'm just going to call this um, Matt's Hot Wallet. And what we're doing now is we are basically watching Ethereum mainnet. I'm going to switch this over to Rinkeby for any transactions involving my wallet address, which, of course, over here on the right, nothing's happening. We're just listening for this in real time. Um, but what we can do is, is actually create a transaction. So what I'm going to do is just send myself some Rinkeby test, test ETH. And what, what happens is pretty interesting. So I'm using stock MetaMask on this machine, and it... Uh, uses Infura as its gateway. So what's going to happen is I'm going to conduct a transaction and uh, Stock MetaMask is going to inspect the transaction and if it's valid, it's going to sign and transmit the transaction uh, to the Ethereum network using uh, Infura. Uh, the Infura gateway is going to inspect my transaction, make sure it's valid, and if it is, it will insert it into its local mempool, a single node. Um, that gateway is then peered with other nodes on the network and it will propagate that transaction to its nodes. And my transaction as a, in pending state will move through the Rinkeby test net from node to node to node via this gossip protocol. Now we at Block Native operate a global data platform. So we have, we operate Rinkeby testnet nodes and we're basically monitoring for any new transactions that might hit one of our mempools. And then we inspect that transaction to try to figure out um, is that something someone cares about? Now, in this case, we're monitoring my own hot wallet. And so what we're going to do is notice a, uh, a match, um, pair it up with my subscription, and emit an event to my mempool explorer right here. Now, that's a lot of steps, but it happens exceptionally quickly because, again, this is a real-time um, environment. So I'm going to now uh, send myself a little bit of test ETH. Uh, right now, and, and I'm just going to click the confirm button right now. Three, two, one. And when it, sorry, when I do so, you'll see the pending event come in. Three, two, one, confirm. And there you can see a pending transaction involving my wallet has, has been transmitted to the uh, Rinkeby testnet. And as soon as the Rinkeby testnet confirms this transaction, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow, there it is, we get a second event. So the status of my transaction is now confirmed. Now, you can see here, these are nice um, JSON payloads. So uh, what what's happening here with Mempool Explorer and our platform is not only are we taking the raw data out of um, the mempool, but we're then enriching it with a whole bunch of additional fields that we parse and, and, and present in a JSON payload to make it very easy to work with as a builder. Now, what we can do and what's really important here is you say, wow, now that I know that this is happening, hey, what I want to do is get a notification to my mobile device as soon as my wallet is party to a transaction. And we provide capabilities where you can um, basically save these results up to uh, uh, an API key that then can be integrated via webhook to anywhere like Slack or Discord or any system of your choosing. And so it's really easy to compose. What I personally do is I have this right out to a private Slack channel and literally my phone lights up every single time uh, any of my hot wallets have a transaction. And so this just massively reduces my transaction anxiety and, and lets me be aware of what's going on anytime I, as a user, am transacting on the network. Um, if you're building, we, we really encourage you to offer this as an opportunity for your uh, uh, users as well. So in fact, um, many wallet providers are out there provide these capabilities using these APIs so that they can notify their users proactively of wallets coming or transactions going out or coming in to the, that wallet address. So that was um, a hot wallet monitoring. Now I'm gonna flip back over here. I'm gonna do this a few times. Uh, and that was our first example um, of, of um, how to master the mempool. Whoops. Okay, now 
our second example is going to be quite a bit more sophisticated. So using similar ideas that we had before, what we're going to do is instead of looking at a wallet address, which by the way, one of the big advantages of having a real-time mempool data platform is we can look at any address, even addresses that have that don't exist yet, or even addresses that um, have no v transaction volume yet. Because our platform is collecting everything, we can just say, tell me what's going on with a specific address. Now, um, that in this case, we're going to be looking at some very popular smart contract addresses, and then we can filter on those with this idea of being able to know first or act first. So let's flip back over to our mempool explorer. Um, here we go, just like we had before. And what I'm going to do is delete the subscription. Um, and now we, we reset a uh, mempool explorer to its start state and we provide um, a series of quick start uh, uh, activities over here on the right. And just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to click this one, which is watch top DEXs for pending transactions. So as soon as I click watch now, what's going to happen is we're going to be watching uh, Uniswap, SushiSwap, Balancer, and Curve for pending transactions on mainnet. Now, this is live, the actual theory of mainnet right now. And so, as you might expect, we're going to get a fire hose of transactions. So, three, two, one, I'm going to click watch now. Here you can see Curve, Balancer, Uniswap, uh, SushiSwap uh, uh, subscriptions over here. And you can see these uh, pending transactions coming in. Um, in real time. So again, this is what's actually these are live transactions on the Ethereum mainnet right now. And you can see the event count here uh, clicking up. Now, just for, for safety's sake, we only will display 50 events um, in the browser and then we'll disconnect from the network. And that is to prevent us blowing up your browser and to prevent inadvertent abuse of our systems. Um, if you wind up with this, you'll see event count is 50 and uh, this up here goes goes red. Uh, to restart and get another 50 events, you just press play again and these events start to, to go forward. And so this is super powerful. Again, we have these rich JSON payloads, um, but you can put in any smart contract here. And what's super nice is you can then filter on any of the fields. So mempool data has this tendency to be um, a fire hose. It tends to be pretty unwieldy. It tends to be a, a lot of processing and data to work with on your end. And so in working with our customers, one of the things that we've learned is uh, the vast majority of data is probably not relevant to the specific application or use case. And so um, rather than get a fire hose and do a bunch of co coding on your own and to deal with that data that needs to be maintained, instead, um, what we offer is rich filtering. And so what's powerful here is you can take any characteristic and you can filter and say, I only want to know um, transactions where the gas price, um, uh, actually, let me look at this, where the, yeah, the gas price way. Um, is greater than or equal to, um, let's just put in here 200,000, okay? Uh, and then when we hit play right now, it's going to filter out transactions which are below a certain gas price in GUI, right? Um, and of course, what that does is really calm down uh, the, the feed. Now, I'm going to clear this one and watch. I click and it just shows right up again. And you'll notice some of these um, subscriptions have this green ABI field um, lit up. That means we're decoding these smart contracts in real time. So in the back end, we decode SushiSwap V2 and, or sorry, SushiSwap and Uniswap. Um, and therefore, all aspects of the ABI are now available for filtering. By the way, um, today we'll, we'll be adding support for both Curve and Balancer. But when I click ABI, I can upload my own here if I, if I so choose. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a subscription filter on the Uniswap v2 router, and I'm going to select um, the contract call and where the method name matches. And what's cool here is now we have all of the, the method names supported by Uniswap v2. So look, I only want to uh, see transactions that are using swap ETH for swap ETH for that token. And let's just turn off the other subscriptions here. Um, and so now we're just listening to Uniswap. But when I hit play, um, now, again, all we're doing is searching for 
pending transactions on Uniswap V2 using the method name swap ETH for exact token. So very powerful ability to zero in on specific characteristics with Boolean operators so that you can see exactly the mempool events that matter to your application, that matter to your wallet, that matter to your trading strategy. And again, the whole idea here is uh, these are techniques which sophisticated actors are using every single day. We as Block Native are trying to democratize access to these capabilities. We're trying to level the playing field so that no matter who you are or your degree of sophistication, you can work with mempool data with the same degree of, of clarity and confidence that the most sophisticated actors in the space can be because we think, quite frankly, you deserve it. And we think, quite frankly, it's, uh, it's healthy for the ecosystem for everybody to have equal access. So that was smart contract transaction streaming. Um, again, I'm going to flip back to my presentation. I'll do this just two more times, I promise. Um, now, uh, uh, yep, I am screen sharing. Uh, let's see here. Am I screen sharing? Uh, sorry, let me try that again. Hmm. There we go. So uh, uh, the, the third of the four examples I want to share is gas, gas estimation via block prediction. So um, every single participant in the network has to deal with transaction fees, with gas fees. However, uh, gas fees are a real-time marketplace. So effectively what's happening under the current regime, again, this is going to change a little bit with EIP-1559, actually changed quite a bit, but but you have all of these pending transactions that are effectively competing for block space. They're competing to be in the next block. Now, Let's think about it. On any given moment, there's anywhere between 80 and 250,000 pending transactions on the Ethereum network. So it's a pretty large set of things that are pending. And any given block contains on average of 150 to 175 new transactions. So you have 100,000 pending transactions, 100,000 plus, competing to be one of the next 175. So as you might imagine, the competition is very fierce to be included in the next block. And how transactions compete for inclusion is they set their transaction fee, which effectively is a incentive to miners to basically include uh, a given transaction as opposed to another transaction. So transaction fees for inclusion are a direct function of the contents of the mempool, what's currently pending. And so uh, there are many... Uh, gas estimation services out there that use all sorts of inputs into how to project what the current gas fees are. And what we have seen is, is some of those are, are inaccurate and, and often wildly inaccurate because they're not dealing with the real input data source that matters, which is what's current the current contents of the mempool. And so uh, what we at Block Native have created is what we call gas platform, which um, effectively focuses on a predictive model of the likely contents of the next block. So we do block prediction. So we're saying, we actually do block prediction multiple blocks into the future. And we say, based on the live contents of the mempool, which transactions are likely to be included in the next block? What are the gas prices of those um, uh, transactions, and then where are the various confidence levels with the minimum gas price to be included in the next block at a uh, uh, with a certain uh, degree of confidence? So, if I want to be in the next block 99% of the time, you know, this is my minimum gas price. If I really only need 95% or 80% or seven or 70%, these are confidence levels that our gas platform provides. And what this does is provide very precise. Uh, 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 fee setting. So if you're an entity which is trying to, to optimize your gas fees, and what we find is that's true of pretty much everybody who's transacting today, that gas fees are a, a major source of concern and anxiety and, and lost profit, um, that, that this technique of block prediction as opposed to time prediction and with uh, very precise confidence levels actually can help you ma proactively manage your uh, your gas prices with, with incredible confidence and with incredible clarity. Um, gas prices, of course, are a little bit of a Goldilocks problem. Set your gas too high and you're basically burning profit because it's not going to go any faster if it's too high. Set your gas too low and you basically erode transaction predictability. So, um, Let's go ahead and show this. And so what I'm going to do again um, is just flip back. 
to my Chrome tab. Here we are. Um, and what I'm gonna do is uh, go back to Mempool Explorer, um, actually, uh, and I will just do this for now. And you can see we have this little gas widget. Now, this is uh, our real-time gas estimator. Um, it's at uh, it's updating every second because I have a, a, an upgraded account. And when I click here, we'll get these gas platform payloads. So you can see every single second we have um, new gas events coming in. It's an API, which is easy to integrate. Let me go ahead and disable auto scroll. These will continue to pop in. But you can see uh, a gas platform payload um, has the current block number at 682. So the next block number is 683. It's been 534 milliseconds since 682 was um, confirmed or was mined. Um, and our model is showing 100 and sorry, uh, uh, an estimated transaction count of 185 transactions in block number 683. The current max gas price is 120, but to be 99% confident that I, my, a, a new transaction will get into this block, the minimum gas price should be 164. Similarly, to be 95% confident, the minimum gas price should be 81. So look at that. That's a really interesting result. If I accept a relatively slight difference in confidence for inclusion at this standpoint, um, my gas price basically gets cut in half. 95% confidence is pretty high. That means 19 out of 20 times I'll make it into the next block. That's a huge savings depending on the nature of your transaction and how urgent it is to get in the next block. Now let's look ahead. So here, remember the, the, pen, the next block number is 683. Here it is again, next block number of 683. Um, uh, and, and we can see uh, the millisecond since last block here going up. And oh, hey, look, the gas price is increasing. So what's happening here is um, as we go forward in time, more transactions are coming in with higher gas price and we're seeing the, the model predict various results uh, uh, for this. And so by getting this real-time feed, as you can look at the next block, you can begin to see what's going on and, and how to act with confidence. Now, this is also, by the way, if you go to blocknative.com, um, we, we synthesize this data into um, a gas estimator, which is publicly available as well. And you can see that right here. So you can consume our gas platform as a uh, API feed, or you can go to uh, blocknative.com slash gas estimator, and you can see these same results updated in real time right here. So you can see again at the top uh, pending block number, and you can see the results of our model showing up here with some of those things that I was showing before. So time since last block, it's going up and uh, max gas price in the pending block. Hey, look, a new block has just come in. Oh, the all the new transactions are streaming in and things are going forward. So again, that is a gas estimation via block prediction um, and, and a way to master the mempool. So I'm gonna stop that one last time. I'm just gonna, this is the last flip, I promise. Um, I'm going to go over and I'm going to share uh, my window here. Okay, there we go. And um, our final, oh, there it is, our final uh, a way to master the mempool is a fairly sophisticated technique called transaction simulation. So uh, in the world of Ethereum, you have uh, transactions or, or external transactions that go user to user. Matt is paying Bob. Uh, Matt's wallet address puts Bob's wallet address from two. And you can see there's, there's $20 of value moving from Matt to Bob. But often, um, Ethereum is a smart contract platform. Matt's wallet is going to call a smart contract. And that call is then going to invoke other transactions. So the smart contract is going to pass transactions to other smart contracts. Those transactions are known as internal transactions. It's contract to contract um, transactions. And, and you don't have on the outside visibility into those transactions when they're pending. And the reason why is you don't really know what's going to happen. So it's sort of indeterminate. The only way by default to know the contents of an internal transaction is after the transaction is confirmed. So you know in retrospect, oh, Matt's transaction invoked uh, a specific 
uh, uh, contract. And then that contract issued a cascade of events that, that may or may not have mattered to me. Now, what we have built at Block Native is what we call simulation platform, which basically looks at all marketable pending transactions identifies those that have these internal transactions and then simulates them against the current block state to determine all the contract calls involved and balance changes. And then basically is fast enough to return results so that you can act on this, right? This is uh, really popular among traders who are basically looking to have visibility into trades happening, into transactions happening on the network that they could potentially trade on. It's also really powerful for builders who want to monitor their, their protocols and protect against um, exploit or, or attack shape transaction. So basically what we're doing by adding a whole computational layer to the mempool is providing visibility into not just external transactions, but internal transactions. So they're just as programmable as everything else. Again, this is another factor of level that leveling the playing field. So every um, uh, party that's out there has access to the same data. And what I want to do now is show this to you. Um, I'm going to, again, flip over to my Chrome tab. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just go back to our homepage. Um, and click right here to get back into uh, Mempool Explorer. And, and what I'm gonna do is go back to uh, the thing we did before with uh, watch the top DEXs. And before we had this, I'm going to just pause this. Um, we had this filter of status is equal to pending. But now what I'm going to do is set a filter where the status is going to be uh, matching a pending simulation. So what we're going to get now is for these four contracts, only simulated uh, payloads. And I'm going to turn off auto scroll here so it doesn't jump by. So here we can see we've received a simulation involving Uniswap v2. By the way, all of these are live transaction hashes. So you can click on these and go over to our friends at Etherscan to see what Etherscan is showing for any transaction. But you can see this is a pending simulation. Inside the JSON payload, you now have this internal transactions field, which has expanded uh, the, this uh, transaction to include all of its calls where the call is going to, how much gas is being consumed and what the inputs were. Um, you can see here as a call to an ERC-20 transfer function for wrapped ether. Um, here is another ERC-20 transfer function for a, 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 func a, 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 a token called kit, DEX kit. Um, and you can see the net balance changes. So basically where the ether, wrapped ether and kit is going to be moving to. And then finally, we summarize and synthesize that into a uh, simulation payload detailed. So we have this entire process took us 63 milliseconds to run that simulation and return the result. And, and again, as you might expect, because this is part of uh, Mempool Explorer, um, all of these fields are filterable. So, hey, if I wanted to um, only filter on simulations, where the performance profile uh, uh, time frame was greater than or equal to a thousand milliseconds, um, I could go ahead and do that. And again, hit play here. And now we'll only be looking at simulations that took a longer time to calculate, which would generally indicate uh, more complex transactions involving uh, a greater number of, of uh, smart contract calls. So uh, again, really powerful ability to look inside what's going on in the mempool and to make this accessible and programmable to, to everyone out there to use and incorporate into your um, uh, into whatever you're building or trading with. So that's all for basically going hands-on and mastering the mempool. We started out with some fairly basic techniques of monitoring your hot wallet and then looking at smart contracts and then doing gas uh, uh, estimation using block prediction and, and finally something much more sophisticated with uh, transaction simulation. So now I'd like to wrap up and uh, uh, what I'm going to do is go back to my deck um, and... Uh, here we go. So, uh, you know, this whole idea here is, and here's part of the, the meme pool. I looked forward in time and saw 14 million futures and how many of them did I win the trade? One, we're trying to help you get to that one winning trade outcome. 
So if Ethereum is a dark forest, if the mempool is the root of transaction risk, um, by shining some light in here, we can begin to illuminate the dark forest. And by shining an increasingly powerful light with increasingly powerful techniques, with increasingly ease, ease of use to use it, we can actually uh, uh, illuminate the entire dark forest and basically uh, make Ethereum, make public blockchain networks um, as uh, friction-free and as risk-free to transact with it as possible, which we think is, is generally quite healthy for the growth and sustainability of the network. Um, we're lucky to work with hundreds of the top projects uh, in the space. So if you're building as part of ZeroX Hack, uh, we really hope that you take a look at our stuff and incorporate it into whatever you're building. And, and please reach out to us over our Discord channel if you have questions along the way. You can join our Discord community via our homepage. Um, very much encourage anybody who's curious about learning more to do so and um, look forward to you uh, building on top of our platform and, and helping you master the mempool. Um, this has been a mempool 101 session. Again, my name is Matt Cutler. I'm founder and CEO of, of Block Native, and we're really excited to have uh, to be part of ZeroX, uh, ZeroX Hack, and to really uh, encourage everybody to, to build with mempool data. So with that, if there's any questions, which I don't see on the right side, I think we're good to go. Um, very much appreciate everybody tuning in, whether you tuned in live or you're watching the replay. And you can find me on Twitter. I'm at M Cutler. And you can also uh, find Block Native. We're at Block Native. And um, happy building. Thanks so much. Uh, Matt, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, absolutely fascinating subject. And uh, I love all the use cases. And I'm just working on uh, launching the monitoring of my hot wallet. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks again for taking uh, time to do this presentation. I was uh, I'm very happy to to have you. My pleasure. Thanks so much.